Today on This Week in Startups, Uber Angel investor Dave McClure chats with us. The Shark Tank takes another victim. And Tyler will be reading the latest tech headlines. My God, it's come to this. Lana's gone, and now we've got Tyler reading the headlines. <laughs> All that and more happening right now on This Week in Startups. It's all about man. They said money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to another This Week in Startups. It's episode 91. We're racing towards 100, and boy, I, you know, we're going to have a great guest at 100. Today, we've got a great guest, and I think these next 10 shows are all going to be epic. I mean, we are basically starting at the top of the technology industry, the top of the angel investor industry, and we're telling everybody, you have to get in within the first 100 shows of This Week in Startups, and the list of guests is unbelievable, and today's guest, Dave McClure, is going to be outstanding. Um, Lots going on uh, here at uh, uh, thisweekend.com and Mahalo. As you can see, new sets designed. Uh, show the two shot. Wow, how beautiful. You notice the quality's going up. Just better and better quality every week. And uh, thanks to Storm On Demand for hosting us and the TriCaster. Although we're still waiting on that HD TriCaster. I can't wait to get my, <laughs> when I get my mittens on that, then we're going to be in really good shape. Um, and of course, thanks to .co. Uh, .co, of course, the .co domain name. It's the newest domain name. 500,000 of them have been registered in just the first couple of months. And it's, there's still amazing domains lev uh, left. I mean, jasoncalacanis.co is left. Am I really supposed to say that on the air, that my name is available? <laughs> Can somebody on my team, I mean, I mean, use your brain, right? right. I mean, I don't want to berate somebody on the show. You know how I'm a very gentle guy about that kind oh, of sure. things. But, I mean, don't... <laughs> I mean, now I have to buy this from a squatter. Uh, superangel.co is available. 500 Startups is available. Dave McClure.co is available. CouponEngine.co is available. WalkingDead.co is available. I mean, there's still a ton of great domains left. And actually, I, I had them reserve Dave McClure.co and 500Startups.co to give them as a gift from the .co folks uh, to Dave McClure because he's such a great guy. Um, if you appreciate the fact that .co and the other sponsors of this show are providing us with the funds for makeup, HD cameras, sets. I mean, all this beautiful stuff. And it, it's like the show is being produced on a very regular basis. And it's really helping startups. I mean, I'm learning a lot. You're learning a lot. Yeah. The startups are learning a lot. Everybody's learning together. And it's really because of that sponsorship of .co, 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 .co don't you know, know .co. It, how well does the .co SEO, no pun intended there. I didn't mean to hip hop that one. Yeah. But if you weren't able to get diamonds.com, and you are a diamond website, right? And you can get diamond. Dot co. Dot co. I bet you you're number two within a year. And you could, especially if you hire Jason Calacanis SEO services. <laughs> I had a great idea this morning. I was riding over here in the Tesla. Yeah. You know, I like to tweak people sometimes. Sure. So my you, new idea. You well, push we, buttons? No. We put up, uh, you know, the new Calacanis.com today. Uh -huh. Josh Nilsson here is a very uh -huh. talented designer at Mahalo. Redid the site for me. I was very thank thankful for that. It's a beautiful site. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just thinking, because we have things along the top, like Open Angel Forum and the launch conference and whatever, you know, uh, Mahalo this weekend. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to put best uh, SEO or SEO services up there. <laughs> and I'm going to offer for $25,000 a day Oh, no. SEO services. Oh, no. <laughs> and I'm going to put a whole thing there about how other yeah. SEOs yeah. charge, you know, three, four, yeah. five thousand dollars a month. It's a complete waste of time. It yeah. costs sixty thousand dollars a year. All you have to do is hire Jason and his team. You'll come, yes. you know, bring like Lon yeah. or whoever. <laughs> and our SEO team yeah. for twenty five thousand dollars will come to your place for four hours and yeah. redo your stuff. And then it'll be like twenty thousand dollars if you come here and do it and right. buy you lunch and everything. Um, and we'll try to get the ranking for best SEO. I wonder if bestseo.co is available. Yeah, those, those guys like really fight over that. Stuff. Oh my God, yeah, and they will be so tweaked. And yeah. I, I've been saying on Twitter that yeah. I'm the greatest SEO of all time right. and that I created all these techniques. Yeah, so right. now I'm basically gonna take credit for every oh, technique no. and just tweak them like crazy. And that's what I love about our guest. He is, he is I mean, there are a few people who can tweak like I can tweak. Yes. And I think Dave McClure is one of them. <laughs> Arrington is one of them. Who else is in that sort of elite 
Dave Weiner, but not knowingly doing so. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. unintentionally, he'll tweak people. Right. Uh, Dave McClure, of course, is an Uber Angel uh, investor. He was the director of marketing at PayPal back in 2004. He taught a Facebook a Facebook class at Stanford. He managed. Just wrote a killer Facebook related blog post. I mean, he's got a killer blog. I mean, yeah. he uses way too many fonts. Yeah. Um, but he's one of those few people. You know, like. You know how it yeah. is. I mean, we, there's very few people that I will... Unique writing style, though. Like very, very good. Very cool voice. And he doesn't <clears throat> give an F, which right. is what I like about him most. Dave right. McClure, welcome to the program. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's about, number one, it's about time. And number two, I think you broke up a little bit, so you have to turn off your BitTorrent. Stop downloading uh, last season of uh, Breaking Bad off of <laughs> BitTorrent or whatever you're doing. Uh, let's test one more time the audio fidelity. Okay. We're gonna call you right back. Is that the Android Dave McClure? We, it is. It's a. It's a, It's a C three PO <laughs> McClure. Um, but anyway, Dave, you know, is uh, at the center of this whole uh, angel controversy, which right. we're gonna get into. Right. He is one of the new Uber proto. I I call them archangels, right. like power angels. Yeah. But there's a big debate. Are they actually angel investors? Because they're not investing with their own money or, you know, only their own money. They're invest. They have a fund. Right. And Chris Sock is one of these now, right. and of course Ron Conway is the but original. Dave, Dave's even a little, I mean, yeah, investor, but up in you know the Palo Alto, the whole uh, Valley area, he's so active in the community and at the events there that it it's more than just the investor. I mean, there's plenty of investors who don't go to the lengths to put on events and dinners and all that stuff. Yes. He he actually is the community up there. I right. mean, he hosts and right. has for years yeah. events, Geeks yeah. on a Plane, you know, all these, like, lunches and stuff yeah. like that. I've spoken on some of his panels and whatnot. He's just... Then people want, you know, Boulder and all... I mean, Boulder has, you know, Brad and Dave and different cities wonder what they need to get, you know, something going. But you need you, a Dave McClure. You need a Dave McClure in your town. Yeah. You know. Charlie O'Donnell in New York is yep. a perfect example. Yep. Uh, Andy Sack in Seattle, who we'll be seeing next yep. week for the first Urban Post example. Yep. Hey, Dave, are you back? Uh, I hope so. I'm here. Mm, still hear breaking up a little bit. That's all right. Let's try one more time. Check, check, one, two. Check, one, two, three. All right. Quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Uh, welcome to the program. Uh, and you have raised a new fund. How much is your fund that you raised this year? Uh, I believe my attorneys advised me not to uh, talk too much about that, but there was oh. a filing out for a $30 million fund uh, that I believe is publicly available on the web. Okay. So uh, a very large fund. And this is actually your first fund, is that correct? Or did you have a fund before? You were investing with your own money before. Uh, I invested my own money uh, from 2004 to 2008, and then I worked for a founder's fund running – uh, kind of their internal angel program uh, called FF Angel, and then also ran the Facebook fund last summer as well. Uh, and so what is your angel philosophy? How do you, uh, do you have a thesis, or are you a spray sure. and pray kind of a guy? Tell us your thesis. <laughs> uh, well, I guess I'm accused of being a spray and pray guy a lot of times, but, uh, you know, really what, um, you know, I think, my philosophy is small is beautiful, and I think there's really an opportunity on the market now for um, being very capital efficient about investing in companies. Um, and I think there's a market opportunity for companies to be uh, acquired for you know between twenty five to one hundred million dollars that a lot of larger venture capitalists are not uh, you know really able to go after. That's you know not their sweet spot. Um, so for us, you know, it's it's a great opportunity that we think fits well with our you know size of funds with you know some of the goals of entrepreneurs and frankly for you know acquirers out there too. Um, so I think you can be very efficient about building these companies, create lots of value for the customers, uh, be revenue focused and for the entrepreneurs who want to, you know, you know, figure out an exit, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And so where do you have to come in as an angel in order to have a good return um, if you're gonna have an exit? which we'll call, you know, you know, single, double, triple, you know, 25, 50, 75 million dollars to make it uh, fund worthy for you. Because, you know, obviously I right. had um, Weblogs Inc., which is exactly in the sort of ballpark of what you're talking about. Yep. We had one angel Absolutely. investor, Mark Cuban, 
and he invested, I'm trying to remember, it was either a 2 or $3 million valuation, and he owned 15% of the company. Um, so he did extraordinarily well when we sold. You can do the math. It was maybe 15 times, 12, 15 times his money in, I guess, like um, a year, a year, under a year. Um, where do you have to invest? Because I'm seeing all these crazy valuations right now. Where do you have to invest to make it profitable? Well, we're not particularly valuation sensitive, but I think we're trying to invest at you know five million and less. Um, in a few cases, we've gone over that, but you know, typically a lot of our investments are between two to four million dollar pre. Uh, in a few cases, it's above that. Um, and you know, we think that sort of companies that are five million post or less, um, you know, we can make money on uh, selling those companies at anywhere from twenty five to one hundred million. Um, the founders uh, probably don't take very much dilution if they're only raising maybe a C round or a small A round. Uh, and if the companies are being sold or acquired at under 100 million, maybe up to you know 150, um, there's a lot more potential acquirers than if those companies you know need to be acquired at half a billion dollars or a billion dollars, where you know only Google, Microsoft, and a few others can pull the trigger on that. Ah, so part of the thesis is the M&A market. If you're trying to go for hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, you're talking about a pool of under 10 players who could pull the trigger on that. Whereas if it's a $25 million, $50 million, there's got to be dozens, over 100 people who could actually uh, do an acquisition in that range. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the sweet spot's really under 250. I mean, I, I think you know a company like Mint being acquired by uh, Intuit for $170 million. Um, you know, it's not a huge. Uh, Intuit's not a huge. Uh, market cap company, but there's still acquirers of companies that aren't you know, ridiculously expensive. Um, the other point that I think is really interesting to think about is a lot of uh, internet startups these days aren't really tech companies. Uh, they're really companies in consumer verticals that have you know technology people behind them, and so the acquirers for those companies aren't necessarily Microsoft and Google's, but they might be like you know Weight Watchers or Nike or a travel company, and there's thousands of public companies out there that are consumer facing that don't really have you know a lot of tech savvy in those companies and so if you can build you know consumer businesses uh, internet startups that are generating you know, five ten million dollars in revenue they're very attractive businesses I think for a lot of these public companies who don't have a lot of web savvy and yet all their customers are online now uh, so this is a new market uh, take us through some of your recent investments and how you made the decision to invest. I think we're in a couple together. Um, uh, you're in Reportive, sure. correct? Definitely in Reportive. Uh, I don't know what other ones, uh, you know, probably one of the more notable ones we're in right now is called Twilio, T W I L I O. Um, and uh, you know, another company that we're an investor in that's a little outside the beaten path for um, Silicon Valley is a company in Japan called MyGango, M Y G E N G O. So um, I'll just talk about those a little bit. Twilio is a company that's um, you know put together a platform for voice and SMS. Uh, allows many developers, uh, both small and large, and enterprise companies to code applications very easily that take advantage of um, voice and SMS applications. Uh, so voicemail ordering systems, um, SMS to voice and transfer. Um, just a lot of different ways to interact and build voice applications and SMS applications on the web. Uh, and Twilio has been adopted by, you know, I believe at this point, over 20,000 developers. Um, so we're really kind of taking an old, not too sexy industry that's like, you know, the voicemail telephony world and opening that up, making it easily accessible, very, very simple APIs for web developers. Um, and you know a lot of other web startups are really big fans of Twilio because it's extremely easy to use. Uh, it's very inexpensive, and kind of has on-demand pricing. Great. Um, hey, let's take one moment to reboot the Skype one more time and see if we can get a better connection. And I'm going to suggest to my guys in the control booth, can we um, when we reboot the Skype, let's just do an audio call and forget trying to do the video, and we'll just have a perfect audio stream. That might work better. Uh, and while we're uh, getting Dave back on the line, I mean this is very exciting. This over. Well, I got 500 people in the chat room, so I just want to make sure the fidelity is as good as possible. Sometimes these things happen, you know. Very rare that we actually have a technical problem in the program. Um, and one place that you're never going to have a technical problem is with MailChimp. MailChimp. My God, I'm in love with MailChimp. 
this is the email newsletter service that I use. This is the one that solved all of my problems with the Jason Nation email newsletter. And I'm using it for the new launch newsletter, which you're going to be able to sign up for shortly at launch.is. I-S. I couldn't get launch.com. That's taken. Uh, launch.co. I'm negotiating. <laughs> Maybe I'll get it. Uh, launch.is is where you can sign up for my um, – you will be able to sign up there. But uh, as you know, I've been using uh, MailChimp for Calacanis.com. I can track my open rate, 60% or more open rate, no open rate with the HTML. I can see with the Faces feature who is actually subscribing to the newsletter. I can see their Twitter account, their Flickr account, if they have those things public uh, and connect to them on those things. They've grown from 85,000 users to 450,000 in just one year. Uh, and boy, it, it's an incredible service. It's gorgeous. I mean, the design of it's amazing. You know, it's like one of those services where they just they they are have incredible attention to detail. Mailchimp on Halloween dressed their chimp up, their you know um, their mascot as Dracula. Now that seems unnecessary, but when a, when a startup has that level of detail and attention to detail, you just know that they're on the other issues like getting things to people's inbox and pass their spam filters. I've never had so many people responding to the newsletter, and when I was using my own email server. I just wasn't getting uh, uh, into people's email box. I was getting caught in spam filters, and MailChimp solved all those problems for me. Thank at MailChimp on your Twitter account. Dave McClure, are you back? Yep, I'm here. Okay, great. Perfect. That sounds a lot better. Tell me, uh, what is your average investment? Uh, 25, 50, 100, 250? I mean, I know it's gone up since you have this uber large fund now. Um, well, I mean, we, we have a larger fund, but our investment size is probably average $100,000. Uh, we've done a pretty ridiculous number of investments this year already, but um, about a little over 60 investments. Wow. Uh, we're, um, our typical investment size is around 100000 maybe a little bit under that. So at 60 investments this year, I believe that makes you the most prolific investor. What is Ron Conway does about 100 or something? or I don't know. I think he... Yeah, I mean, I, I know Ron does a lot. Um, there is a pretty substantial difference in kind of the philosophy, I think, that Ron's going after, although I have a ton of respect for Ron, uh, yep. regardless of, you know, recent events. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think Ron has a really entrepreneur-friendly approach uh, um, and definitely helps with a ton of connections and contacts in the industry. Yep. Um, our uh, program is going to focus a lot more on product and market. So, you know, I've been a developer in the past, I've been an entrepreneur, I've been a marketer, um, and the fund is going to have a really strong focus around product development, uh, design and user experience, and then distribution. Ah. Um, so we uh, really want to see companies that are fairly conservative on the revenue model. Um, so in, in most cases, we want to understand pretty early how they plan to make money, or at least you know that they have a service that people will pay money for. Um, and then our job is really to help them, you know, either on the design side uh, and user experience and usability side to get a great product out the door, um, or also on the distribution side, scale up based on a lot of the platforms that we feel we have good expertise on. So search, social, and mobile platforms primarily. Um, and I think that that's a different approach than most other investors are taking. There's not really as many people focusing on design issues and distribution issues. Um, and you know, we think that's an advantage that's very differentiated from most other investors in the market. And when it comes to it, I'm assuming that you came up with this model because you've seen over the last, whatever, 10 years that design and distribution are probably two of the reasons uh, that companies win. I mean, those might be the top two reasons right there. I, I think so. I mean, we obviously still have you know, a ton of uh, focus on a technical founding team, but you know, that's, at least in Silicon Valley, that's not usually the hard part to solve. Um, mm. There's lots of technical founders here with you know, pretty strong you know, bench depth. Um, but what is still a challenge and what I always got questions about you know, when I was investing in companies is you know, how do you find a great designer, how do you find a great marketer? Um, so with a company like Mint in particular, design played a really important role. Um, you know, with a company like SlideShare, they used search. Um, you know, SEO is one of their you know, distribution platforms. Um, for a lot of the Facebook companies that you know we were involved with teaching the class, you know, Facebook was obviously a distribution platform. Um, but I, I think a lot of technical founders just don't pay as much attention to you know design and user experience issues uh, early on, um, and so they may have a great product idea, but if the user doesn't really understand how to use that product, they may not you know get a lot of adoption. Uh, clearly, 
that is a, a big part of the issue. And you, you have these technical founders, and Y Combinator is spawning a zillion of them. Um, and that's great that they're technical, but in a lot of cases, they may not understand the marketing side as uh, you know, uh, in depth. They may not understand the customer and the consumer side. So I think we're seeing technical uh, execution that's you know, at an all-time high, but maybe the marketing and the business side um, leaves a little bit to be desired, correct? Yeah, and in fact, we're, we're pretty big fans of YC. We invested in eight companies out of the recent batch of Y Combinator uh, companies. Um, so there was a pretty good fit with us and a lot of the YC batch. I think Paul does a fantastic job really identifying technical talent and helping them build out product. Um, and then for a lot of those companies, we you know felt like they were a really good fit for our program and trying to help them develop further on you know the usability and design side and then scaling up on the distribution side. Um, how much of an impact has Y Combinator had on entrepreneurship in the Valley, do you think? Uh, you know, I think probably they are the single biggest, um, you know, factor in the last five years uh, on the Valley. Um, you know, I, I do think that one of the other things that's also been happening in the Valley is, uh, you know, AngelList and Venture Hacks. I think Naval has done a pretty amazing job with that as well. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, YC really set the standard for how, you know, early angels early stage investing um, is done with a, with a very product and hands-on approach. Um, and, you know, Paul has developed a huge network of people and quite a number of successful companies. Uh, so Dropbox, Zobni, Heroku, Weebly, um, just a ton of really great companies that have come out of there and a fair number of, you know, smaller size uh, companies that have had some exits as well. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the sort of valuation bubble angel bubble. It seems like a lot more people in the last two years have gotten involved in angel investing. I'm one of them, I guess. You're one of them. I mean, you've been around for more, longer than that, but you've gotten particularly active. Yep. Angel List is obviously on fire. I've, I take five meetings a week from Angel List, uh, Open Angel Forum, which you've helped with in the Valley, yep. eight cities. Is there an angel bubble? Is there a valuation bubble? Well, I mean, there might be higher prices going on. So, you know, I think whether or not it's a bubble will take a few years to find out based on you know how people are investing. I, I think the, the things that are going on that are definitely happening is you have a bunch of angel investors who are new to the market jumping in. Uh, so, you know, historically, you know, Microsoft, Yahoo, um, you know, PayPal type of folks, but now also Google and Facebook and Zynga folks jumping in. Um, and a lot of those angel investors are are pretty price insensitive. So you know, when I came out of PayPal and started doing angel investing, I really you know didn't know what I was doing too much on, and making money wasn't the most important thing. I think really getting the chance to be involved with early stage companies was you know very exciting, and you know I was still learning the ropes. So for a lot of new investors, you know, price isn't so important as kind of getting the chance to work with great founders. Um, at the same time, I think there's a bunch of you know large VCs who kind of feel like they're getting their mojo stolen, <laughs> yeah, um, and that they feel the need to really you know dive into more seed-oriented deals than historically they've been involved with, uh, in order to you know feel like they have uh, you know a toe in the water and at least some sense of what's going on. Um, and for those VCs, you know, they're also a little bit less price sensitive um, because you know they're playing for much larger stakes. So whether or not they give a slightly higher valuation at seed than other people might, you know, probably isn't as important to them as you know eventually getting uh, an inside track on a great deal, um, and they can eventually pay up to get the ownership that they want. Why, so, is, it, why is it so important that these VC firms get? you know, 25%, 35%, you know, you hear this often that, you know, this VC firm, X VC firm only cares about getting 25, 35%. They don't care how much they pay for it necessarily, seven, 10, 15 million post money valuation. They just want that 25, 35%. Why is that such an issue for them? Yeah, I, I, that always confused me because I really feel like, you know, while people talk about ownership percentage, really it's absolute return that matters. Um, you know, so we're, 
generally not thinking about ownership percentage. We think more about sort of what price do we invest at and what price you know do we think we can exit at. Um, I think for most VCs, the reason that the 20% number is important is because they want to take board seats, and there's sort of a minimum ownership level that's required to sort of be able to you know jockey for position on getting board seats. Um, mm. So that that's why I think the 20% number is important. Um, and there's other, you know, there's other VCs who don't care about that as much. I think, you know, Fred Wilson's gone on the record saying that, you know, ownership isn't as important to them. Um, but I think board seats are important to larger investors who, you know, really are, you know, in it for the long haul, want to have a driver's seat in the company and feel like a board seat is important in order to defend their position. Ah, what is your best advice for a hot startup company today coming out? Like, let's say Hipmunk or reportive, these are both very hot Y Combinator companies uh, with you know great founders. If you were running those companies and you were telling them exactly what to do, and they had, I could raise uh, you know a half a million. Let's say they want, both wanted to raise a million, and I think they both actually did somewhere in that range. Um, yeah. So I want to raise a million, and they have an offer on the table from Kleiner, Sequoia, and then and you know Andreessen Horowitz, you know these huge firms, Benchmark. They all want to get in there, Excel. And then on this side, you have the same million dollars on the same terms, let's say for 20% of the company or so, from a collection of 10 angels, um, let's call it five angels, you know, Dave McClure, Chris Saka, Shervin, you know, high profile angels. What would be the argument to go with the angels versus, my God, the big blue chip, well known Wall Street Journal is going to cover Sequoia, you know, Mark Andreessen? What, how would you advise them? Well, I mean, I don't think the PR reason is the angle. I mean, I think plenty of us at the super angel category have access to the same, you know, type of people on the PR side. I think the the advantage to going with a large VC firm is access to a ton of capital, um, and really, if you're going after huge markets um, and there's entrenched players and there's lots of capital requirements, then that's a good reason to do that. You know, so for for Dennis at Foursquare, you know, if you're going to go compete with, you know. Yelp and you know maybe Facebook and Google for location um, and location-based advertising is a huge market. Then yeah, it does kind of make sense to take a big round and go for a big you know raise from from VCs. Um, on the other hand, I think for companies that I I think this is more the average case. Um, you don't really need to take rocket fuel right out of the gate, um, and I think for many folks who haven't found the business model yet and are still trying to understand how they make money. Uh, preserving small market exits on the table. Um, you know whether or not you take a million dollars from a Kleiner or a Sequoia, you're still going to have the same exit trajectory and expectations from those companies um, because of who they are. Um, so I don't, you know, a fifty million dollar exit is not going to make Sequoia or Kleiner or those guys happy. <laughs> right. Why um, not? Why not? Unpack that for because we have a lot of people who are new to the game. Why is a Sequoia or a Kleiner going to say, oh, my God, a $50 million exit is just underwhelming? Why is that? Well, I mean, it's because of the size of those funds and the expectations for return. So, you know, for funds that are 300 to $500 million in size, you know, general expectations for, the, for any venture capitalist is probably a 3x uh, return for their fund. Hmm. Um, so let's say, you know, you're, if you're a big fund that's managing $400 million, you're trying to get a 3x return over 10 years. You know, or something around there. You're probably aiming for one point, you know, one or one and a half billion in exit value. Um, now, if they own twenty percent of companies on average, then mm. that really means that they're aiming for five to seven billion dollars in total exit value in the companies that they're investing in. And now, most of those funds make about thirty bets, um, you know, thirty investments over the life of their fund. And you know that's really challenging, right? You're trying to get wow. Yeah, you have to have a tremendous track record. If you have right. a four hundred million dollar fund, you make thirty bets of fifteen million dollars, twelve, fifteen million dollars each. You have to get seven billion dollars out of that four hundred million dollar investment. Seven right. billion dollars, which if you're Sequoia, and you have YouTube and Zappos, both billion dollar plus exits. You still got five billion to go, correct? Right. That's that's two of the five exits you got to get, right? Right. You got to get. You got to get five. Oh. YouTube's out of your portfolio, <laughs> or one, or one Facebook, or one Google, right? Which, right. You know, or eBay, very often. or Zynga, or Twitter. Uh, yeah. I think Zynga, Zynga is probably still in that range of you know that's maybe you know one x your fund, but it might not be you know five yeah. x your fund. <laughs> what's the uh, so, what's the best deal you passed on? 
that you best regret. Do you and I have passed on? Yeah. Uh, From two th- since you started angel vesting, which one did you have a chance? You got to be totally honest here. Did you have a chance to go into Twitter, Zynga, Facebook? What did you pass on that you regret? I mean, I'm not usually playing for the big deal stuff. Right. I think the one that I didn't recently pull the trigger on that I really wish I had is Ubercab. Ah. Uh, I, and that's a service that I would definitely use. And I just was busy with a bunch of stuff and I wasn't paying as much attention. But I really like that business. I invested in that. That was an open uh, angel o- forum. OAFS. <laughs> <laughs> great, great, yeah. great business. And why did you, why did you miss that? You, you, you're just so overwhelmed with deal flow that it just slips through the cracks? Is it, is it that simple? Um, yeah, that has been the, the issue recently. I know we've been very active, but we've also been pretty visible and we've had a lot of stuff coming our way. And I'm, I'm sure I've missed several great companies just as a result of the fact that we've, we've had a tremendous amount of, you know, deals and opportunities, um, which, so, you know, it's, it's a good problem to have, but it's, a, it's unfortunate when you feel like there's a really solid company there that you, you know. What do you, you, know. What do, you do in a case like that? Do you, do you email the founders and say, I missed this, can I get in? Is there a way for me to get a late entry? Can you do that in, in angel investing? Um, I mean, sometimes you can. I generally try not to be an asshole about, you know, trying to shove my way into a round late. Um, yeah. you know, I think there are folks who, you know, may do that and certainly for, if you if you have kind of juice and you feel like that's, that you could add value, I think that that is an approach that some people go after. Um, I, I, I think and that's in some unfair. cases that's unfair to a certain extent because you basically everybody else had to to make the bet and then you get to just follow on like uh, the risk has been taken out in a certain extent right yeah I mean I, I do think you know it's up to the entrepreneur and the investor to really figure out you know whether they add value and you know I, I would say that uh, as my my friend Jeff Clavier likes to say the round is never completely closed <laughs> 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 um, but I think it's important for the investor to recognize why they bring value to the table and the entrepreneur to, to kind of understand that, you know, things may not be completely even for all the investors in their round and that may create problems for them to manage if they if they want to do that. Um, and I, I just think that it's important to really understand what value you bring to the table and define your brand and your value as an investor. Um, so f- for the stuff that I like to do, you know, I built a reputation around kind of this startup metrics for pirates and a lot of the lead startup philosophy that Eric Rees has been, you know, pushing. Um, but you know, just in general, we focus around product uh, and distribution. Like, and those are those are areas that we're going to continue to be very heavily involved in. And a lot of what we're building out with our startup accelerator program, you know, here at, at 500 Startups, is emphasizing those areas and bringing in mentors who kind of emphasize those areas. When, when you look at an entrepreneur, young entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial teams, the founders, what do you see as common traits amongst them? There has been this meme going around that in order to be a great entrepreneur, to be a great CEO, you have to be in some ways mentally unstable. There was a big story in the New York <laughs> Times, like just crazy enough. Uh, certainly, we've got a lot of friends uh, in common who are insane. Many people would say you are a little insane with your blog <laughs> postings and F you and quoting rap lyrics. Not that I would know anything about that because people have said the same about me. Uh, can you yes. be well adjusted and be an entrepreneur? What are the things you look for in terms of entrepreneurs? Um, I think there's plenty of people who can be well adjusted and be entrepreneurs. Uh, at the same time, I think a little bit of uh, you know, off balance and different approach is an advantage. I mean, I think you know, people who are whether they're mentally unstable or just like look at the world differently, um, you know, they just have different rules and they break rules. And you know, while those people may fail more often, they may also succeed more often. There's just there's more shortcuts available to people who don't follow the same rules as the rest of society. Yeah. Um, and so I think it is, you know, it is sometimes a reasonable thing to bet on people who um, you know aren't going to look at the world the same way that everybody else does. Uh, and so for most investors, we do have a tolerance for, you know, a little bit of radical insanity. Um, you know, at the same time, you've got to find balance. And right. um, I would say that there's plenty of people who I think are great initial, you know, brainstormers, product people, uh, entrepreneurs that might not be the right people, you know, later in the company's, you know, life cycle to be, you know, dealing with making sure that everything's kind of like, clocks and trains are running on time. So you kind of have to figure out what what part of the life cycle the company is is dealing with and what strengths you bring to the table. And having a balance of crazy people and rational people is probably not a bad thing. So when you're investing, a little bit of crazy on your side is good, but uh, a little bit of logic and ability to scale and manage 
in the later stages, not so bad either. Yeah, uh, that's the typically you want you know crazy people in the discovery phase to like you know brainstorm and tinker and find cool things. Uh, you want sort of people who are growth oriented as the company's you know taking on new customers, and then you want people who are more operationally and you know you know revenue focused once the company gets to later stages and you know has to be sustainable and making money. A question from the uh, chat room: Ram Vaz asks, "Do you look down on MBAs when an MBA comes in with a business plan? Do you look at it and say, my God?" I would never invest in an MBA. What um, I don't look down on MBAs. I do look down on business plans, at least for the you know type of stuff we're doing. I think business plans are really just over-engineered. Mm. Um, you know what I do count as important. You know whether it's in a business plan or in a deck <clears> or in a demo <throat> is understanding unit economics for your business and understanding paths to customers. So you know business plans. I, I mean, I I kind of shit all over business plans just because I think. Writing twenty, you know, thirty-page business plans is really a waste of time. It's a complete most, waste of time, right? I mean, is it yeah. is it is it or is it not BS? Uh, it's almost entirely BS, and revenue projections in particular, I think, are complete BS. Um, but so. It's almost like insulting sometimes when they give you the the the, the business plan because it says we're going to make zero, we're going to lose three million dollars, then we're going to make three million dollars, then we're going to make thirty million dollars, then we're going to make three hundred million dollars. I yeah. mean, isn't something absurd like that every time? Well, I, I do think the investor community is also to blame because a lot of investors ask for you know five year revenue projections, hundred billion dollar you know sort of outcomes, and like it's just bullshit. You know, there's there's no truth to that stuff, and we're all guessing. Um, and I think the things that are interesting is kind of showing, you know, defining your customer and their problems, and you know the type of solution that you're trying to build to address those problems. Um, and then maybe you know understanding you know marketing channels and customer acquisition um, you know economics those are those are interesting right because it is useful to think about like how are you going to go after building the product how are you going to go after getting the customer what does it cost to get the customer what do you think it might you know be possible to make on a per customer basis that's like tactical stuff like. Acquiring customers, should I use SEM, should I use SEO, how am I going to get these right. people in the door and how much will it cost to see if you can get the flywheel going and you can scale, correct? Yeah, and I'm not even asking for people to have extremely you know, detailed plans there, but just to kind of understand, okay, is this going to be a paid search acquisition play, is it going to be organic play, are you going to do affiliate play, are you going to do something on you know, social platforms? Are you going to be trying to do mobile-based distribution? And, and then looking at the team and saying, does the team have you know, the chops to pull off that type of you know, customer acquisition? Just, just like when you're looking on the product side, you want to know, you know, do these have the right developers and background and skills? And do they have designers who kind of can, you know, make compelling products? Um, so you want to kind of, you know, for me, the, the three roles that I really try and pay attention to to make sure the startup has together is the developer, the designer, and the distributor, for lack of a better term. I, I don't typically call it a marketing function because it's not; it doesn't look like most marketing on the on the normal case. All right, let's get into it. Uh, Mike Arrington writes a piece that you're doing some crazy angel gate. Uh, we've had many <laughs> discussions at at the Open Angel Forum about yeah. challenges for angels. This story was a complete fabrication, correct? Uh, well, I don't think Mike thinks it's a fabrication. I think Mike. But what do you think? I mean, what, it, you were there. You hosted yeah. the dinner. It was a complete um, fabrication, correct? Uh, I think Mike got his facts wrong, and I categorically deny that there is any price fixing or collusion going on. He's absolutely wrong about that. So he was lying. I mean, basically, he made it up. Well, I mean, Mike has some sources who you know he has not revealed who say that those things occurred, and you know until he's willing to name those sources and have them go on the record. Um, I don't know where he's getting that info from. Uh, the That's very convenient that for him, but I mean, he, it's pretty obvious that he basically stumbled upon this dinner and then added these sort of pieces to it. You were there, other people were there. They said very clearly, if 10 people who were there say clearly there was no discussion about price fixing, there was no discussion about price fixing, correct? Uh, there wasn't, and you know what Mike was interpreting as price fixing, I believe, was people talking about valuation. And yes, we definitely talked about valuation. I think people talk valuation all the time. By every um, open angel forum, we talk about valuation. On this show, we talk about valuation. And every time an angel investor meets with an entrepreneur, they talk about the valuation. I mean, yeah. that's inherent in every discussion, correct? Yeah. And you know, I think the other part of it that was kind of pissed me off was that Mike took a very one-sided approach about you know what items were discussed and didn't talk about a lot of other things that were discussed. Where about you know how do we improve the market opportunity for? 
exits? How do we increase connections with you know entrepreneurs and downstream capital? How do we you know figure out? I think in many cases you know the investor and the entrepreneur are more likely aligned than not aligned. Um, you know, yes, there's certain things where we're negotiating for price when we're doing rounds, where we're sitting on opposite sides of the table. But for the most part, you know, we're sitting on the same side of the table trying to figure out how to make the company successful and how to make money. And you said before, I mean, if we, we invest as angel investors at a three, four, five, six million dollar valuation, it's actually at the end of the day not going to make that much of a difference uh, overall, correct? I mean, you're, you're, you're not that valuation well, sensitive. No, I mean, I, I do think there's a point there to be sensitive about. Like, so, you know, it is true that there's a lot of competition, and it is true that incumbents are concerned about prices getting too high. And, you know, for certain Y Combinator companies where the pre money price is north of five, you know, there's just going to be less people at the table. Um, for some folks that are not interested in doing convertible note, you know, they're not going to make those investments. Um, and it certainly is the case that, you know, if we're, if we're aiming for $50 million exits, you know, we're going to make more money on a company that's, you know, at a $4 million pre than at an $8 million pre. Um, so whereas a large venture capital investor may not really care so much and maybe, you know, putting money in at later stages and, you know, really aiming to own 20% for a company that exits at half a billion, um, yeah. They care less about that first round valuation because they're you know, they're adding position over time at later stages. Ah. Whereas the angels really you know the majority of their ownership is going to happen at that first investment level, and you know if it's at you know a five million pre on a fifty million dollar exit, they get a ten x. If it's at a ten million pre on a fifty million dollar exit, they only get a five x. Yeah. And so the so, valuations do matter. They are discussed, yeah. but I mean yeah. to even. To even think that price fiction could occur, this is what struck me as. I mean, I, I know Mike personally very well. Obviously, worked together for many years. This is his writing technique. I mean, he likes to throw things up and see if he can get traction with them. <laughs> and I think that's what he did here. Yeah. And we both know yeah. Mike will do anything to get link baiting. You know, like with the female, you know, women in tech posts. I mean, he, 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 that's just the way it works. But the truth is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Dave. If there was a great startup. Facebook, Twitter, Zynga, whatever, raising an angel round. There was absolutely nothing investors would do not to get in that round if it was a great company and a great entrepreneur. They would run over each other and they would never collude because they would rather beat each other and they would and they would go for the higher price, correct? Well, I mean, I, I think that it's certainly the case that you know, if there's a hot opportunity, people are going to like you know try and do their best to get in on the deal. And right. short of killing someone, uh, hopefully there's not unethical practices going on. Uh, I do think there's a lot of aggressive investors in the valley. And that's why I was saying before. I think it's really important to define what brand and what value you bring to the table. Um, I do think that it's more likely the case that on the angel level, there's people who are syndicating deals and inviting other angels into deals than at the venture level. So ah. the game is actually a lot more cutthroat at the VC level because usually there's not more than one VC in yeah. a deal, whereas there is typically a lot more angels in the deals. Um, right. But I think the, the major trend that's really going on that is the big issue is convertible note versus price round. I think that's really what's happening. Yeah. So um, take us through that. What is a convertible note? So a convertible note is basically a debt instrument that converts to equity at a later time, uh, typically after a price round occurs. And usually the structure of that convertible debt instrument is it's basically prior you know, to that price round occurring, so there's some discount. Usually 20% is the number that most people use to the value of a future priced round. Hmm. Um, and usually, in most cases, more recently, there's been a cap on valuation so that it's no more than X. Huh. Um, and that basically also you know, ensures that the investor is going to get some minimum you know, ownership stake in the deal. Um, but if the investor, if the entrepreneur can raise money at a certain level, they can get up to the maximum possible amount. Um, so convertible notes with a cap are a very popular vehicle these days. Um, they don't cost as much as a price round, so typically they're you know less than five thousand dollars to do a convertible right. note, um, whereas a price round might cost ten to twenty five thousand uh, dollars. They require a lot less paperwork, a lot less time. Uh, but what's most important is it does not require all the investors to agree. Right. So the convertible note instrument is a, an instrument between one investor and an entrepreneur, and the entrepreneur can make it available to other investors, but they don't have to, and the money can come in immediately. Whereas a priced round 
is you know an agreement between all the participants in the round. Typically, money needs to come in at about the same time, and all the investors need to sign off. Huh. So whether Mike is interpreting this correctly or not, you know collusion. Whether it's not illegal, but you know priced rounds <laughs> are a form of collusion because all the investors at the table need to agree on price. Right. Convertible notes are not because right. people don't need to agree on what the convertible note terms are. And in fact, what's been happening lately with Y Combinator companies is they've actually been giving out slightly different convertible note terms to different angel investors based on how quickly they invest and in some cases based on the entrepreneur's perception of their value. Ah, so and, they could go to somebody and say, oh, we think that Shervin is going to be awesome and come to a lot of meetings. We're going to give him a 30% discount. We think... Yeah, this other angel investor is not going to really add a lot of value. We can give him a ten percent discount. Is that how they do it? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's being done as much, and that's the radical one, right? right. I think the more common situation is, you know, the first, you know, couple hundred thousand dollars maybe is raised at a lower cap or a more significant discount, ah. and then the next hundred thousand, which I think is actually a reasonable way to think about it. I think that early sure. in, early investors making the decision sooner should get you know better terms because they're taking more risk right um, and I've actually encouraged a couple of companies that I'm you know talking with right now to split their rounds up into two pieces or three pieces and potentially do the first part of that at you know like a three million dollar cap and you know then do the next one at four and the next one at five ah, so they give a term sheet and they say okay Dave McClure is putting in three hundred thousand at a three million cap Jason Calacanis is going to put in Forty thousand at a four million cap, and then Shervin's going to come in last and put in fifty thousand at a, a five million dollar cap. But then you have to do this crazy math at the end, right? When you price the round. Well, no, because you're basically. I, let's let's look at it more simply. Let's just say that there's a company that wants to raise five hundred thousand, uh, and they did, were thinking about raising on a four million dollar cap note. Yeah. Right? And what I might suggest that they do is say split that into two pieces mm -hmm. and do two hundred fifty thousand on a three and a half mil cap note. And the other two hundred fifty thousand on a four and a half mil cap note, hmm. right? And still up to them whether they want to do that at four and a half or they want to do it at lower. But what it sets is a differential pricing, you know, opportunity for investors. And there's you know some principle of scarcity that's now in place. Yes, you've created a marketplace. It motivates the investors to make a decision, you know. And this is what all entrepreneurs want to like see is that people make a decision. They don't wait around for other investors, you know, and say, oh, okay, well I'll invest after somebody else invests. Which is bullshit, in my opinion. Like, yeah. you know, if you think the company is interesting, you should be willing to write a check. You yeah. know, and it, it definitely helps to know that there's other people in who've done due diligence. But you know, you maybe shouldn't get as favorable terms if you're waiting around for other people. And so now, by like breaking into two parts, at least there's more incentive for investors who feel like the company's worthwhile to jump in. They get a little bit better terms, you know, than the other investors who want to wait. The entrepreneur is able to raise some amount of capital to get started, and then you know the last 250. If the round is oversubscribed, then the entrepreneur can say, "Okay, we're going to you know raise that other round at four and a half." If the round's undersubscribed or they don't really get to the full 250, maybe they end up you know just giving the remaining 250 at the at the same price. But that's a risk that the later investor is going to take and say, "Well, if I wait too long, you know I might have to pay the higher price, or I might not get in at all." Okay. Let's talk about a uh, final question. Entrepreneurs listening to this show, they've got a killer idea. At what point should they email you? Obviously, you, your email's out there uh, or tweet to you or you know, try to get in touch with you. Should they wait till they've got a, should they do it when they have a business plan? Should they do it when they have a team and, and, and mock-ups? When do you like to see a business? Uh, in general, I like to see a business when they have a prototype together. Okay. Um, if it's someone who's built a product previously, you know, and there's proof points that they can build a product, then I'm okay with talking to them about concept. But in, in most cases, I want to say that there's a prototype together. So ideas, um, that, that doesn't cut it. If somebody says, I got a great idea, I've never got no track record, they should not be emailing you yet. Well, and I, you know, the problem with me is that just that I'm getting pitches all the time. And so, right. you know, what I've always recommended to people is, you know, the best way to get in touch with me is through portfolio company CEOs and our mentors. And that those people are the people that we trust to advise us on making deal investments anyway. Right. There's people we've bet before on. They're people that we you know, think we want to refer the companies we invested to. So with all of those people, there's you know, different areas of expertise. And it, I think it's much easier 
if you're a startup to identify, okay, I'm doing a business. It's a you know maybe it's an iPhone application for kids around education or something. You know, there's other companies we've invested in that have either the customer segment, the customer focus is you know kids in education, or the vertical is in that area, or the you know application and tools they build have been based on you know iPhone or apps. So there's there's definitely people all across our portfolio and all across our mentor network who have those skills. You know, and they're going to be much easier to get in touch with than me. <laughs> um, and if those people think you have an interesting business, then I'll absolutely take the meeting. Okay. So to recap, have a prototype. Uh, you should know how you're going to make money. Have some conception of that. You said that earlier. You should know your acquisition costs, perhaps. How you're going to get these customers in the door. How you're going to get that flywheel going. And of course, look at your portfolio and bond with somebody in the portfolio so that you're not coming into the. I'm assuming you get three, four, five hundred emails a day, right? I, I get a lot, and it's really just hard to, you know, I, I'm not trying to be an asshole about it, but it's very difficult to assess everything that comes in. Um, and I think, you know, we have over 90 mentors in our program. We have over 60, you know, companies in our portfolio. There's 150 people that you can, you know, talk to or get in touch with a lot yeah. easier than you can get to me, who probably have domain specific specific knowledge, they have platform specific knowledge, they have customer specific knowledge. There's probably three to five people in that group that are a really good fit for you to talk to who would be likely big advocates, you know, to get us in front of, uh, get you in front of us to have a meeting. You're going to want to fof. You're going to want to fof them. Friend of a friend. Make friends with one of Dave McClure's friends. Make a great prototype. Have an idea of how you make money. Know your acquisition costs. I'm assuming have a great domain name, and you might get a meeting with Dave McClure. <laughs> Dave, thank you for being super honest. Obviously, I'm a huge fan uh, and think that you are uh, an awesome angel investor. Anybody who gets you as an angel investor is very lucky to have you there because I know you work tirelessly on behalf of the startups. And I was actually really disappointed that you know people piled on you during that angel gate thing and I, and I really wanted to write an, uh, a newsletter post about it but I've just been very busy with the kid and everything and I sort of feel like a jerk for not doing it but just so everybody's asked me about the angel thing, Dave is top shelf as far as angel investors are concerned he is the best of the best and he has always had startups and entrepreneurs first and he could do a lot of different things and make a lot more money than he's making doing what he's doing and he chooses to help entrepreneurs He's a consummate gentleman and an awesome angel investor, and I really appreciate having you on the program. Uh, thanks for everything you just said, Jason, except I'm absolutely not a gentleman. Uh, oh, please, come on. <laughs> and you have to deal with this guy. This guy picks up every check. I'm not even kidding. He'll pick up every check. He's, he hosts everybody all the time for dinners, for speaking things. He's had me at you know his different soirees. Uh, constantly uh, a consummate host and, and a really great angel investor. Continued success and good luck with everything. People can find you on the web at... Uh, you can find us at 500startups.com, and my blog is 500hats.typepad.com. Awesome. Uh, thanks Thank a you. lot, Jason. Thanks so much for being on the program, Dave McClure. Awesome. Right. Yeah. Great interview. I mean, yeah. and you, you know people love hearing from the angels. You get 550 people in the, in the chat room, and he's totally honest. Yeah. And it just, you know, I have to say, you know, Mike and I were friends for a long time. Obviously, we're not friends anymore after the... He stole the TechCrunch conference, TechCrunch 50 conference from me. Um, but man, I mean, what a jerk move to take somebody like Dave McClure and accuse him of things that obviously didn't happen. And I think just Mike fabricated it all. Well, you and I have a little more insight into what probably happened because when Dave was hosting the Silicon Valley Open Angel Forum, Correct. he kicked off a conversation which was all around... Lowering costs. Lowering the cost for the start with... Dave, with um, Shervin uh, and yes, yeah, no, was Shervin there that night? He wasn't. He it wasn't. Was, it was. Uh, it was at Shervin's friend's house, though. It yeah. was no uh, Jeff Clavier. Jeff Clavier. Yeah, they were talking about how can we save money for right. startups. Right, with the startups in the room. With the startups in the room, it's yeah. unbelievable. You know, yeah. like this. But it was all the angels talking amongst themselves about how to yeah. improve the. You know, but, I mean, this is why Mike is hated. I mean, it's basically, he, you know, if you're friends with him, and there's a whole list of people who had really great <laughs> friendships with him, and Dave and him were friends. It's just a matter of time. You can count the clock. It just sort of in reverse. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I've developed a great friendship with Mike Arrington, and then the clock starts ticking, and then at some point he, he turns on you, and he tries to destroy you, like he did with me with the Serpico posts, and trying to discredit me and say I'm a liar. Then he tries to destroy Dave McClure. He tries to destroy Lauren Feldman. He just tries to destroy people, and he uses TechCrunch. And that's why I'm launching Launch, because I really think TechCrunch, you know, although there's some great writers there like Eric and, you know, MG, I mean, Mike is... 
basically uses TechCrunch to beat people up and to praise them. So like when you're on the inside, I mean, remember all the great posts I got from Mike all the time? And then I get my ass kicked for you know, all eternity. Same thing with Dave McClure. You know, he's on the inside, and then Mike decides he's going to beat him up. But launch will settle everything, because when launch launches, uh, I think there'll be a new sheriff in town. And you'll see what real journalism is about. It's not about beating people up and using your brand as some you know, bat with nails in it to serve your own bizarre purposes. But anyway, I'm just, <laughs> not that you would know anything about I'm just, that. Just yeah. a, it's a little you know, just side note. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love Tyler Shot. Let's see Tyler Shot one more time. Look at that, with the dot .co behind you. I mean, if you're an advert, the dot .co, I mean, get a recognizable domain name. Just you give know, it Tyler, one more time with They Tyler's. could purchase this space right here, Yeah, we're going to put a Tyler. You know, that would be, extra. oh my god, if we put a logo on the side <laughs> of your head. No, that's an old shout back to the be, uh, uh, Ted Murphy episode of Kelly Canis Cast. All right, let's do a Shark Tank and then get out of here. Everybody knows the story of Shark Tank. Shark Tank is obviously a parody. That is Mark Burnett's show here, uh, based on the Dragons Den, I believe, in London. They invited me to be part of it. Then they never called you back. Bizarre. But I saw Mark it happened, Cuban. It happened to somebody else as well. Mark Cuban, it happened to. Yeah. But I saw Mark Cuban tweet that he was just on it. So I think maybe they got Mark Cuban signed up because he tweeted he was on it. I would love to be on Shark Tank, but of course it'll never happen. This is, the, this is my, I, I have to forge my own way, have my own program. <laughs> you're just afraid halfway through the middle of the taping you're going to turn right to the producer. No, the I just start telling him what to do right now. No, I mean, just, it's ridiculous. I mean, when are they going to put me on TV? I mean, basically, it's a conspiracy. I mean, five times they've called to do a reality television show. You've been involved. Five different producers. Five different of producers of reality. Very networks and shows, yeah. Production called yeah. to Oh, Jason, we love This Week in Startups. Oh, TechCrunch 50 is amazing. Oh, we love your email newsletter. We want you and Tyler to be on this reality TV show. You can be like my, you know, sidekick on the show. And then it, they just, they, it never happens. And that's why I love doing this show, because I can do it on my own terms. I think because they I do. I got my own sponsors. They dig in, they do the due diligence, and then they realize w what they're getting into bed with, and then it What, just too apart. crazy? Yeah. Uh, give me a break. They don't, are you saying I'm too crazy for reality TV? Like a Donald you're, Trump? You're born for reality TV. Of course I am. But I, you know what, I, I, the problem is, I think you're right, they, don't, they, they know that I wouldn't do it in a cheesy way. And I don't like the Shark Tank, like, abuse the entrepreneur kind of a thing. Right. Because that's not really how it goes down. And if it does go down like that, you're sort of a jerk of an angel investor. Yeah. Okay. On Jason's Shark Tank, not Mark Burnett's Shark Tank, we have Chaz. Chaz, are you there? I'm here. Okay, you Chaz. Got me? Uh, and uh, you are right now in a broom closet in yeah, a am. mental facility. I'm in Pittsburgh. I'm in uh, same the same uh, thing. University yeah. of Pittsburgh MBA office. A MBA or NBA? MBA. Not, not Mark Cuban's uh, National okay. Basketball Association. So you're going for your MBA, so your brain is being melted, and is. Uh, you are going to pitch us. You have 60 seconds. Are you ready? Perfect. Three, two, one, go. So Fanatics is where Gowalla meets Geklu for college sports fans. Fans earn points and virtual goods for checking in their favorite team activities such as games, tailgates, pep rallies, post-game celebrations, or road trips. <clears throat> um, so why go after this market? Well, first off, ESPN and the sports-related apps are not focused on the social elements of being a college sports fan. They're more worried about sending out player statistics, score updates, rather than highlighting the, the intense rivalries with being a sports fan or the crazy student sections at Duke or Ohio State. And then on the geolocation front, Fourscore and Gowalla really aren't designed for the college sports fan in mind, and they simply end at the check-in to a location rather than the sporting event. With us, the check-in is just the beginning, kind of like the opening kickoff or the tip-off to a game. So in the end, we're trying to employ Dave McCor's uh, popular advice, niche to win. Okay, great. Did it in 54 seconds. Uh, very clear pitch. You're making the Gowalla or Get Glue. Uh, Get Glue was on the program, great uh, interview. Goala, something I'm invested in, so good to use that as an example instead of Foursquare. Uh, pretty, pretty savvy uh, uh, on the pitching front, know your audience. And uh, you want to help people check into games, as in college sports. And then uh, I guess they can do stuff with their friends. I think the pitch, I'm seeing these scores coming in, in the chat room. I see eight, I see seven for the pitch. I'm going to give the, the pitch was pretty clear, actually. Maybe a seven or eight, maybe seven, seven and a half. What do you think, Tyler, for the pitch? Uh, the pitch was fine. Yeah. He's obviously a smart guy. Yeah. 
well spoken. Right. Delivered the idea very well. I understood what the idea is. I know what he wants to do. I understand no it perfectly. So I ha I give it an eight on that alone. Okay. So great. The so, idea I'm not crazy about. And you know I had the same thing. I'm underwhelmed by the idea um, because it seems so niche. You are about that's the first word that comes to too, mind. Almost too niche. Right. And almost why do I care? Why am I going to care about this idea so much? I mean I'm obviously I'm a sports nut when it comes to the NBA. I can understand the value of checking in that I'm watching the Knicks game. But what's the reason, Detra? Why am I here? What is it, what is it going to make it like I have to, like I don't feel I have to check in at the Knicks game. Some what, things, is my, what is my value that I get from right. this is Some what I'm wondering. Can so be, I give the idea five. Right. Some things get more value out of becoming niche. Like right. communities, a Q&A site can be, blogs can Blog, be. Blog, sure. But checking, checking in? in, I don't know that that's something you want to... Narrow Nisha down. Ties. It's almost like it wants to be more. Like right. I've, I would love to see Gowala have get glue functionality, like check in at, you know, what movie right. you're seeing or something like so that. By, wait, the audience what? is giving a ten, a seven, a six for the idea. Um, what What are your thoughts? Uh, you, you've heard us, Chaz. Uh, we liked your pitch, but we're underwhelmed by the idea. W why should we care about this idea? What's going to be like the thing that makes me want to come back over and over again to it? Um, well, I, I don't think it's too niche because, I mean, they, they do claim that there's 150 to 175 uh, million college sports fans out there. And the ones that you find out there, the ones I want to go after, are insanely, insanely passionate about their teams. And, you know, they devote, you know, some people devote their entire weekends or their entire Fridays and Saturdays to their teams. So, you know, I just used check-in. It was a sh you know short pitch. I couldn't really delve into the details, but helping well, go, them with with go. travel. Um, you know, when people travel on the road, mm -hmm. um, helping them with geo-targeted deals when they're heading to um, campus or yeah. games like that. But um, all right, now you okay. Hold on. A second. I know that Jason's watching the next game. Like people go to those sports. Right. I the guy who goes to the Texas Longhorns yep. thing. He's there every Saturday. I know he's there. I don't. So I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna stop you for a second. What you're falling into is kitchen sink entrepreneur syndrome, which is I don't have a good enough idea to start with or a compelling enough idea in and of itself. Therefore, I'm going to throw every possible thing at it. So you threw a group on at it. You threw a travel at it. Like, okay, we're going to help you like book your tickets and get you there. You threw in like, oh, we're going to get you deals when you're there. Like, realistically, those things are probably not going to happen if they do, they're going to be very niche. What you need to do, I believe, There's and listen, I'm just one guy. You need to really think about the experience and find a pain point. Uh, just about to something say. that people either you have to find something inspired that people cannot conceive of. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of Steve Jobs style. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know I want the iPhone, but when I get it, I do. You know, or some other service like Twitter, where it's like I didn't know I needed that, but it's just totally inspiring. Or something extremely pragmatic, like. My There's God, I had this problem, and Kayak solved it because I don't have to go to five websites. There's, Tyler, also, there's also something else about it, which is, and this is kind of, I don't hear people talk about this much, but I'm, it's a new idea I'm kicking around that I'm applying to a lot of ideas that I hear, which is the emotional factor of different ideas. Yes. This idea, the, the event that it's tied to, the sports game, has a bigger emotional weight than the thing that you're stapling onto it. Yes, the check-in isn't as emotional as the experience of watching the game Correct. or celebrating or crying afterwards. Right. Facebook has a lot of, in, in and of itself, just using it is kind of an emotional thing for people. Like, I got tagged in this photo. Oh, gosh, I got to see what photo that is. You know, I got to sure. click through this Oh, it's link somebody's see, birthday. Oh, somebody changed yeah. your relationship status. Well, to, for some people, that's very big. You know, there's emotional weight to all of that stuff. Absolutely. So try and find an, an interesting use where you could phrase it as a problem, find a problem that people have, or find something that people can get emotional about in some way. Yes, very good point. Right. So uh, there's three different ways I think you can skin this cat. One, look for a problem. Uh, two, find some inspired idea, right. very difficult, uh, unless you're Steve Jobs uh, or Ev Williams, great idea guy like that. And then third, uh, maybe look at when people's pulse goes up. What, what process during the game, before the game, after the game, makes them agitated or happy or joyful or sad? And it seems to me... Now, if, you could, now if he could find some crazy loophole to allow betting through all of this, he could be well, on this about betting. <laughs> forget about betting. I mean, you, 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 there's millions of ways to gamble online. If you want to, you're going to get it done. Um, really, actually, I think, 
commiserating after the event. Is there mobile betting? Like real yes. simple, dead simple yes. mobile? We'll never be on the iPhone, which is like one of the reasons I'm going to probably drop the iPhone because I want to play full tail poker and I can't on my iPhone or my iPad. On Android? On Android. Sports? You can do... Uh, well, let's just say, I don't want to say anything about... I don't, I don't do sports betting because I like to bet over things I have control over. But on the full tilt front, I would not be surprised, given that yeah. I'm a red tail, I'm a yeah. full tilt pro, member of the full tilt team, blah, 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 blah. I'm a sponsored player. Uh, you know, I'm probably more proud of that than I've uh, accomplished. But they're going to wind up having that on Android. A dead simple mobile betting of course, college of gaming. That could go but crazy. even better than that. Not that I, I believe support betting. Is if you look at sports radio, yeah. uh, and I am a, a maniacal Knicks fan, I will listen to WFAN in New York. After I would go get home from the Knicks game, I would listen to WFAN, and I would wait for the replay of the Knicks game at midnight. And I would be listening for three hours after the game to Marianne from Brooklyn and everybody on the fan, WFAN, uh, listening, talking about the game. And then I would watch the uh, bridge, you know, Knicks in 60 after they replayed it. Um, so maybe there's a way to tap into that emotional state before the game and after the game. Yeah, if you can. During the game, you're kind of busy watching it. So anyway, Chris, there's a lot of ideas for you there. Uh, anything you want to add? Uh, talking about the after game, I mean, you saw with the Giants last night, the uh, the riots and all that sort of stuff. So if you can capture right. through pictures, through video, through that, that shared experience of your team winning and, and triumphing over the, your, your rival school or, or something like well, that. Well, that's a perfect example of it. Last night... There's ro I was making jokes about I, it on Twitter. Hilarious tweets. Well, well, I, I mean, it was cracking me up. Yeah. So, but anyway, the, I thought I and and obviously I think it got a little bit more serious than people. I, I didn't know that it was getting kind of serious, and people got hurt, so I feel bad about that. But anyway, you're allowed to joke about things when people get hurt. Um, and we're sort of joking about Robert Scoble like throwing a garbage can through the window at Apple Store and then rolling around in iPods. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you, it was a really surreal moment because everybody was listening to the San Bound Francisco police scanner yeah. and then commenting on Twitter about what was on the scanner. So on the scanner, like, oh my God, happy donuts, happy donuts. And everybody's doing hashtag happy donuts and how there's 50 cops at happy donuts and happy donuts the fire's out of. Of course it's out of happy donuts. Right. Uh, and then they're talking about like, it's a 40 year old naked man running around. And I said, oh, well that's obviously Mark Canner. <laughs> uh, and, but he's, I said, somebody corrected me, he's obviously 50 or 60 or 70 years old. Um, but anyway, there was a good example of hyper, hyper, Emotional right. experience going on. The, the, the most, you know, the, the most if, uh, emotional yeah, people can get is when they start burning. There cars. is a lot of emotion to be tied to sports, no doubt, and deeply emo like uh, almost caveman, like you know, this is our uh, clan kind of vibe. It's very right? primal. Yeah, that's why afterwards they want to flip over cars and turn them on fire. Absolutely, like, it's very we won. Yeah, but it's you know, city versus city, clan versus clan. If you can tie something into the emotion of that. Mm. that rides on that. And this is what Zuckerberg's genius is, by the way. If you watch that movie, like, he finds something that people get very emotional about. Yeah, he tweaks it. And how to tweak well, it in a way to leverage well, that. I think that's why, I mean, I actually think that at this point, because yeah. I, I remember I did that post, like, is are they stupid? Yeah. Are, are they clueless? Or are they evil? Mm -hmm. shady or, or sinister? Shady yeah, or shady or stupid, or stupid kind yeah. of thing. And it's like, it's obviously, they know what they're doing with Beacon. Mm -hmm. They know they're pushing the envelope. And like Dave McClure said, you know, he's a radical. And the same thing with... Um, uh, the groups thing. I'm going to let people, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting to subscribe to groups every day on f Facebook. It's mm -hmm. so annoying. And then also uh, with the uh, check your friends. And so anyway, uh, make an emotional connection. Good luck with it. And we wish you Thanks, luck. Thanks, Gus. Cheers. Appreciate Thanks. it. And I'll, one last thing. I, I suspect he will, that may not be the idea that he actually ends up executing on. Hmm. But he uh, that's me. usually the case, right? Yeah, no, yeah. but you, you strike me as a smart guy who's going to figure something clever out. I, he does say, uh, and so you're in your first year or your second year getting that MBA? Second year, yeah. yeah. I get I to talk to Mark Cuban. He's a Pittsburgh guy. How much did you spend on this MBA? Uh, Be honest, too, how much did it cost? Too much. Uh, what does it cost per year? It's 15000 per F year. 15 15 correct. Oh, that's not so yeah. bad. Were you, were you going to a state school or something? Well, it's in state. I'm in, in. I grew up in PA, so it's okay. it's, it's Pittsburgh. Yeah. Nice. Some of these people are spending fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars a year on these yeah. MBA programs. I'm like fifty. You could be a hundred, hundred fifty G's. Yeah. Get three of those knuckleheads together and forget about giving your money to Columbia or Harvard or NYU or whoever you're giving that to. Three guys put three hundred thousand dollars together. You start a startup company. You're done. Anyway, uh, good job, Chess. Thanks, Chess. Chess, go. Uh, we're at one minute and one hour and nine minutes. Um, I am going to be on This Week in Poker later today discussing 
uh, the brutal hand where I laid down a set of tens. Uh, it was about $300,000 in the pot on the big game. Uh, at 4 p.m., I'm going to be on the This Week in Poker uh, and analyze hands. And luckily, I folded that hand. Even though I was the odds favorite, I would have lost 100 f- f- Gs. Boom, 100 dimes, gone. Uh, and that's 100 dimes I could put into a startup company. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Tyler, for doing everything. We'll skip the news because Lon's not here. I'm just, I don't have it in me. And uh, <laughs> I just don't have it Sorry. in me. No, but we're going to have some really great people. Like, Sean Perschel is going to yes. do the news. My friend Mark Thompson, who's a professional newscaster, is going to do the news one day. And Kathy Choi is going to do the news one day. So we've got really great uh, newscasters coming up. Thank you to .co. Don't you know? It's good at SEO. Mm-hmm. And MailChimp for supporting This Week in Startups and Independent Media. Tony Shea. Tony Shea, good friend of mine, will be at the Mahalo offices on Thursday night uh, on his book tour. And I'm supposed to say something about that. What am I supposed to say? Uh, am I supposed to invite people to that? Are they allowed to come? Tony Shea from Zappos is stopping by the studio this Thursday at 8 p.m. We'll be broadcasting a Q&A with him live Thursday at 8 p.m. Pacific. Tune in to thisweekend.com, 8 p.m. Pacific live. And Kevin Hartz is on this Friday from Eventbrite. What an amazing company. Raised a ton of money. I missed the round, but Kevin Hartz will be on the show Friday. Awesome entrepreneur. We'll see you next time. And investor. And he also did some angel investing, but I think he's sort of stepping back from that to focus on the... I heard like $100 million in tickets are going through Eventbrite. Yeah, but he's done some some really smart investments, like on a record basis. Can we end the show? Yeah. All right. We can go forever here. Okay. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. What it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you.